to tell your grace that having heard by fame of this so noble and so fair assembly, this night to meet here they could do no less, out of the great respect they bear to beauty, but leave their flocks, and under your fair conduct crave leave to view these ladies, and entreat an hour of rebels with them. Mm. Pray, Lord Chamberlain, uh, tell him they have done my poor house grace. For which I pay him a thousand thanks. And pray him take their money. <laughs> find out, and he will take it. Uh, let me see, then. By all your good leaves, gentlemen, here I'll make my royal choice. Ye have found him, Cardinal! <laughs> you hold a fair assembly! You do well, Lord! You are the churchman! No, I'll tell you, Cardinal, I should judge now unhappily! Ah, I am glad your grace is grown so pleasant! Uh, my good Lord Chamberlain, prithee come hither! What fair lady is that? <clears throat> and please, your grace, Sir Thomas Boleyn's daughter, who the Viscount Rochford, one of her highness women. Aye, heaven, she is a dainty flower. Sweetheart, I were unmannerly to take you out and not to kiss you. Help, gentles, let it go round! <laughs> Sir Thomas Rommel, is the banquet ready in the privy chamber? Yes, my lord! Your grace, I fear, with not. Dancing is a little heated. I fear too much. <laughs> yes, where shall I my lord, in the next chamber? Lead in your ladies every one. Sweet father, I must not yet forsake you. Let's be merry. <laughs> my good lord cardinal, I have half a dozen healths to drink to these fair ladies, and a measure to lead them once again. Then let's dream who's best in favor. Let Music knock it! <laughs> Now done with the ceremony of bringing back the prisoner. 
Were you there? Yes, indeed, was I. Pray speak! What has happened? You may guess quickly what. Is he found guilty? Yes, truly is he. Why? And condemned upon. I'm sorry for it. So are a number more. <laughs> Certainly the Cardinal is the end of this. Mm. Tis likely. All the Commons hate him perniciously, and all my conscience wish him ten fathom deep. I can give an inkling of an ensuing evil, if it fall greater than this. Good angels, keep it from us! <laughs> what may it be? You do not doubt my faith? This secret is so weighty, it will require a strong faith to conceal it. Let me have it! I do not talk much. <laughs> <laughs> I'm confident you shall, sir. <laughs> oh, have you not of late days had a buzzing of separation between the king and Catherine? Yes, but it held not. For when the king heard it out of anger, he sent word to the Lord Mayor straight to stop the rumour and to lay those tongues that doth disperse it. But mm. that slander, sir, is found a truth now, for it grows again fresher than e'er it was, and held for certain. The king will venture at it. Either the cardinal or some about him near have, out of malice to the good queen, possessed him with a scruple that will undo her. To confirm this too, Cardinal Campeggio is arrived of late, as all think for this business. Tis the Cardinal, and all to revenge him on the Emperor for not bestowing upon him at his asking. The Archbishopric of Toledo, this is purposed. I think you have hit the mark. Oh, but it's not cruel that she should feel the smart of this. The Cardinal will have his will, and she must fall. Tis woeful. <coughs> we are too open here to argue this. Let us think in private more. Good day to both your graces. How is the king employed? I left him private, full of sad thoughts and troubles. What's the cause? It seems the marriage to his brother's wife has crept too near his conscience. No, his conscience has crept too near another lady. <laughs> Tis so. This is the cardinal's doing. The king cardinal. That blind priest like the eldest son of fortune turns what he lists. The king will know him one day. Pray God he do. He'll never know himself else. How holy he works in all his business, and with what zeal! For now he hath cracked the league between us and the Emperor, the Queen's great nephew. And he dives into the King's soul, and there scatters dangers, doubts, ringing of the conscience, fears and despairs, and all these for his marriage. And out of all these, to restore the King, all the counsels of divorce. The loss of her that, like a jewel, hath hung twenty years about his neck, yet never lost her luster. Of her that loved him as angels love good men with. Even of her that, when the greatest stroke of fortune falls, will bless the king. Hey, is not this cause pious? Heaven keep him from such counsel. Tis most true. These news are everywhere. Every tongue speaks them, and every true heart weeps for them. All the dare look into these affairs, see this may end. The French king's sister. Heaven will one day open the king's eyes that have so long slept upon this bold, bad man. And free us from his slave. We have need pray and heartily for our deliverance. For this imperious man will work us all from princes into pages. All men's honours lie like one lump of him, to be fashioned into what pitch he please. For me, my lord, I love him not, nor fear him. There's my creed. As I have made without him, so I'll stand at the king, please. His curses and his blessings touch me alike. Their breath I not believe in. I knew him, and I know him. So, Wolsey, I leave to him that made him proud, the Pope. 
Let's in, and with some other word, put the king from these sad thoughts that work too much upon him. My lord, you bear his company. Excuse me, the king has said the other way. Besides, you'll find the most unfit time to disturb him. Health to your lordships. Thank you, my good lord Chamberlain. How sad he looks! Sure, he is but afflicted. Shh, shh, shh. Who's there? Ah! Pray God he be not angry. Who's there, I say? How dare you thrust yourself into my private meditations? Who am I? Oh, a gracious king who pardons all offenses, malice ne'er meant. Uh, our breach of duty this way is, uh, is, is business of a state in which we come to know your royal pleasure. Ye are too bold. Go to, I'll make you know your times of business. Is this an hour for temporal affairs? Out! My good Lord God, my woolsey the quiet of my wounded conscience, thou art a cure fit for a king. You are welcome, most learned reverend sir, into our kingdom. Use it and us. Take care, my lord, I be not found a talker. Ah, sir, you cannot. I would, your grace, would give us but an hour of private conference. We are busy. Go. This priest hath no pride in him. Not to speak of. I would not be so sick before his place, but this cannot continue. If it do, I'll venture one have at him. I am not. Your grace has given a precedent of wisdom beyond all princes in submitting freely your scruple to the voice of Christendom. Rose, the nurse of judgment, invited by your noble self, has sent one general tongue unto us. This good man, this just and learned priest, Cardinal Campeggio, uh, who once more I present unto your highness. And once more, into my arms I bid him welcome! <laughs> and thank the holy God pray for their loves. They have sent me such a man I would have wished for. <laughs> your grace must needs deserve all strangers' love. You are so noble. <laughs> His hand, I tend to my commission by whose virtue the court of Rome commanding you, my Lord Cardinal York, are joined with me, their servant, in the unpartial judging of this peace. Two equal men. The Queen shall be acquainted forthwith for what you come. The most convenient place I can think of for such a receipt of learning is Black Friars. There you shall meet about this weighty business. I will see. See it furnished. Oh, my lord, would it not grieve an able man to leave so sweet a bedfellow? But, conscience, conscience, tis a tender place, and I must leave her. Venture maidenhead for it. Uh, and 
so would you, for all this spice of your hypocrisy. You, who have so fair woman's parts on you, have too a woman's heart, which ever yet affects eminence, wealth, sovereignty, which to say sooth are blessings, and which give, saving your mincy, the capacity of your soft chevral conscience would receive if you might please to stretch. Nay, good trope! Yes, true! And true, you would not be a queen. No, not for all the riches and the heaven! <laughs> Tis strange. A threepence bird would hire me all desire after queen it. But I pray you, what think you of a duchess? Have you limbs to bear that mode of title? No, in truth. Then you are weakly made. <laughs> so off a little. I would not be a young count in your way for more than blushing comes to. If your back cannot vouchsafe this burden, tis too weak to ever get a boy. How you do talk! <laughs> I swear again, I would not be a queen for all the world. For little England, you venture on in balling. <laughs> I myself would for Carnarvonshire, though there longed no more to the crown but that. <laughs> no, constant. Good morrow, ladies. What word worth to know the secret of your conference? Good, my lord, not your demand. It values not your asking. Our mistress sorrows, we will pity. It is a gentle business, and becoming the action of good women. There is hope, all will be well. Now I pray God, amen! <laughs> you bear a gentle mind, and heavenly blessings follow such creatures. That you may, fair lady, perceive I speak sincerely, and high notes taken of your many virtues. <clears throat> the King's Majesty commends his good opinion of you, and does purpose honour to you, no less flowing than Marchioness of Pembroke. <laughs> to which title, a thousand pound a year annual support, out of his grace he adds. I do not know what kind of my obedience I should tender. More than my all is nothing, nor my prayers are not words duly hallowed, nor my wishes more worth than empty vanities, yet prayers and wishes are all Beseech your lordship, vouchsafe to speak my thanks and my obedience, as from a blushing handmaid to his majesty, whose health and royalty I pray for. <laughs> Lady, I shall not fail to approve the fair conceit the king hath of you. I have perused her well. Beauty and honour in her are so mingled they have caught the king. And who knows yet? But from this lady may proceed a gem to lighten all this isle. I'll to the king and say I spoke with you. My honored lord. <coughs> Why, this is it. See? See? <laughs> I have been buried sixteen years in court, have yet to court your beggarly, nor cause compact betwixt too early and too late for any wow. What you? Oh, faint! A very fresh fish here. Five! 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 Upon this compelled fortune, your mouth fill not before you open it. This is strange to me. How tastes it? Is it bitter? <laughs> or depends, no! <laughs> a lady once, tis an old story, who would not be a queen, that would she not for all the mud in Egypt. <laughs> Have you heard it? Come, you are pleasant. Oh, with your theme, I could all mount the mark. The Marchioness of Pembroke, a thousand pounds a year for pure respect. No other obligation. <laughs> My life, that promises both thousands. Honor's train is longer than its false cat. By this time, I know your back will bear a duchess. <laughs> Say, are you not stronger than you were? Good 
lady. Make yourself mad with your particular fancy and leave me out on it. Would I have no being if this salute my blood a jot? It faints me to think what follows. Come, the queen is comfortless and we forgetful in our long absence. Pray you do not deliver what here you've heard to her. What do you think me? <laughs> the authority allowed you may then spare that time be it so proceed say henry king of england come into the court henry king of england come into the court yeah say catherine queen of england come into the court catherine queen of england come i desire you to do me a right and justice and to bestow your pity on me for i am a most poor woman and a stranger born out of your dominions, having here no judge indifference, nor no more assurance of equal friendship and proceeding. Alas, sir, what have I offended you? What cause hath my behaviour given to your displeasure that you should thus proceed to put me off and to take your good grace from me? Heaven witness I have been to you a true and humble wife, at all times to your will conformable, ever in fear to kindle your dislike, yea, subject to your countenance, glad or sorry as I saw it in crime. Where was the hour I ever contradicted your desire or made it not mine too? Or which of your friends have I not strove to love, although I knew he were mine enemy? Or which friend of mine that had to him derived your anger did I continue in your liking? Nay, gave notice! by you. If in the course and process of this time you can report and prove it to against my honour ought, my bond to wedlock, my love and duty against your sacred person, in the name of God turn me away and let the false contempt shut the door upon me and so give me up to the sharpest kind of justice. Please you sir, the king, your father, was reputed for a prince most prudent, of an excellent and unmatched wit and judgment. Ferdinand, my father, king of Spain, was reckoned one day wisest prince that there had reigned by many a year before. It is not to be questioned. They had gathered a wise counsel to them of every realm that did debate this business, who deemed our marriage lawful. I humbly beseech you to spare me, while I may be by my friends in Spain advised, whose counsel I will implore. If not, in the name of God, your pleasure be fulfilled. You have here, lady, and of your choice, these reverend fathers, men of singular integrity, and learning, yea, the elect of the land who are assembled to plead your cause. It shall be therefore fruitless that longer you desire the court, as much for your own quiet as to rectify what is unsettled in the king. His grace hath spoken well and justly. Therefore, madam, it is fit for this royal session to proceed, and that without delay, their arguments be now produced and heard. Lord Cardinal, to you I speak. 
Your pleasure. Sir, I am about to weep. But thinking we are queen, or long have dreamed so certain that daughter of a king, my drops of tears I'll turn to sparks of fire. Be patient yet. Oh, I will. When you are humble, may <laughs> fall, or God will punish me. I do believe, induced by potent circumstances, that you are my enemy and make my challenge. You shall not be my judge, for it is you have blown this call betwixt my lord and me, which God's due quench. Therefore, I say again, I absolutely abhor, yea, from my soul, refuse you for my judge, whom I hold my most malicious foe, and think not at all a friend to truth. Madam, you do me wrong. I have no spleen against you, nor injustice for you or any. How far I have proceeded, or how far further shall, is warranted by a commission from the consistory, yea, the whole consistory of Rome. I do beseech, gracious madam, to unthink your speaking and say no more. My lord, my lord, I am a simple woman, far too weak to oppose your cunning, your meek and humble mouth. You sign your place and calling in for seeming with meekness and humility, but your heart is crammed with arrogancy, spleen, and pride. I must tell you, you tender more your person's honor than your high profession spiritual, that again I do refuse you for my judge and hair before you all appeal unto the Pope to bring my whole cause before his holiness and to be judged by him. This queen is obstinate. <laughs> Stubborn to justice, apt to accuse it, disdainful to be tried by, is not well. She going away! Call her again. Catherine, Queen of England, come into the court. Madam, you are called back. What? Need you not to break his your way? Trusted for speaking false in that. <laughs> Thou art alone. If thy prayer qualities, sweet gentleness, thy meekness, saint like, white like, government obeying and commanding and part sovereign and by itself, don't speak thee out. The queen of earthly queens, she's noble born, and like her true nobility, she has carried herself toward me. Most gracious sir, in humblest manner, I require your highness that it shall please you to declare in hearing of all these ears, for where I am robbed and bound, there must I be unloosed, although not there at once and fully satisfied, whether I ever did broach this business uh, to your highness or laid any scruple in your way which might induce you to the question on it, or ever have to you, but with thanks to God for such a royal lady, spake one, the least word which might be to the prejudice of her present state or touch of her good person. My good Lord Cardinal, I do excuse you. Yea, upon mine honor, I free you from it. You ever have wished the sleeping of this business, never desired it be stirred, but oft have hindered, oft the passages made toward it. On my honor, I speak, my good Lord Cardinal, to this point, and thus far, clear him. Now, what moves me to it? I shall be bold with time and your attention, then mark the inducement. 
Thus it came give heed to it. My conscience first received a tenderness, scruple and prick on certain speeches uttered by the Bishop of Bayonne, the then French ambassador, who had been hither sent on the debating a marriage which the Duke of Orleans and our daughter married. In the course of this business, at a determinate resolution, he, I mean the bishop, did require a respite, wherein he might the king his lord advertise whether our daughter were legitimate. Respecting this, our marriage with the dowager, sometimes our brother's wife, this respite shook the bosom of my conscience, entered me yea with a splitting power, made it tremble the region of my breast, which for such way that many maze considerings did throng and pressed in with this caution. At first, methought I stood not in the smile of heaven, who had commanded nature that my lady's womb, if it conceived male child by me, should do no more offices of life to it than the grave does to the dead. For her male issue, or died where they were made, or shortly after this world had aired them. Hence I took a thought. This was a judgment on me, that my kingdom, well worthy the best male heir in the world, should not be gladdened in it by me. Thus follows that I wait the danger my realm stood in, by this slight issue failed. That gave me many a groaning throat. Thus, Holland, in the wild sea of my conscience, I steered toward this remedy. Whereupon, we are all now here together. It is to say, I meant to rectify my conscience, which I then did feel full sick, and yet not well. By all the reverend fathers and doctors of the land's learned, unsolicited, I left no member of this court, but by particular consent proceeded under your hands and seal. Therefore, Go on, but no dislike in the world against the person of the good queen, but the sharp forty points of my alleged reasons drive this forward. Prove what our marriage lawful. By my life and kingly dignity, we are content to share this mortal state to come with her, Catherine, our queen, before the primest creature that's paragon in the world. So please, your highness, the Queen being absent, tis a need for fitness that we adjourn this court till Father Jay, meanwhile, be the earnest motion made to the Queen to call back the appeal she intends on to his holiness. I perceive these bishops do trifle with me. I have bought a bit dilatory sloth and tricks of Rome. Oh, my beloved and well learned servant, Cranmer, prithee return. With thy approach, I know my comfort comes. Break up the court. Set on, I say! The two great cardinals wait in the presence. Would they speak with me? They willed me say so, madam. Pray their graces to come here. What can be their business with me? A poor, weak woman fallen from favor. I do not like their coming. Now I think on it. They should be good men. Their affairs are righteous. But all hood make not monks. Please, your highness. Your graces find me here part of a housewife. I would be all against the worst may happen. What are your <coughs> reverend lord pleasures with me? May it please you, little madam, call your private chamber. We will give you the full cause of our coming. Speak it here. There is nothing I have done yet my conscience deserves a corner. Would that all other women could speak to this with as free a soul as I do. My lord, I care not so much. Another, if my actions were tried by every tongue, every eye saw them, envy and base opinion set against them, I know my life so even. If your business seek me out, and that way I am 
from wifing, out with it boldly, truth, love, open dealing. Noble lady, I am sorry my integrity should breed and service to his majesty and you so deep suspicion where all faith was meant. We come not by the way of accusation to take that honor every good tongue blesses, nor to betray you any way to sorrows. You have too much good lady to know how you stand minded in the weighty difference between the king and you, and to deliver like free and honest men our just opinions and comforts to your all. How, sir? Put your main cause into the king's protection. He is loving and most gracious. It will be much both for your honor, better, and your cause, but let the trial of law overtake you. You will cause away disgrace. He tells you rightly. Ye tell me both what ye wish for both my ruin. Is this your Christian counsel? Out upon ye! Heaven is above all, yet a there sit a judge no king can corrupt. Your rage mistakes us! My lord, I dare not make myself so guilty to give up willingly that noble title your master wed me to. in your business. We are ready to use our utmost studies in your service. Do as you will, my lords, and pray. Forgive me if I have used myself unmannerly. You know I am a woman far too weak to make a seemly answer to such thousands. Do my service to his majesty and pray. He has my heart yet and shall have my love while I shall have my life. Fathers, bestow your counsels on me. She now begs that little thought when she set foot in here, she should have bought her dignities so dear. complaints and force them with a constancy. The cardinal cannot stand under them. If you omit the offer of this time, I cannot promise but that you shall sustain more new disgraces with these you bear already. I am joyful to meet the least occasion that may give me remembrance of my late friend the Duke to be revenged on him. What he deserves of you and me, I know. What we can do to him, though now the time gives way to us, I much fear. If you cannot bar his access to the king, never attempt anything on him, for he hath a witchcraft over the king in his tongue. <laughs> fear him not. 
His spell and that is out. The king had found matter against him that forever mars the honey of his language. No, no, the king is settled not to come off in his displeasure. So I shall be glad to hear news such as this once every hour. Believe it, this is true. For in the divorce, his contrary proceedings are all unfolded, wherein he appears as I would wish mine enemy. How came his practices to light? Most strange. How? How? The cardinal's letters to the Pope miscarried and came to the eye of the king, wherein was read how that the cardinal did entreat his holiness to stay the judgment of the divorce. For if it did take place, I do, quoth he, perceive my king is tangled in affection to a creature of the queen's, Lady Anne Boleyn. Ask the king this. Believe it. Will this work? Uh, the king in this perceives him, how he comes to the hedges his own way. Will the king digest this letter of the cardinals? The Lord forbid. Mary, amen. No, no. There be no wasps that buzz about his nose will make this sting the sooner. Cardinal Campeggio is stolen away to Rome, hath taken no leave, has left the cause of the king unhandled, and is posted as the agent of our cardinal to second all his part. I do assure you the king cried ha at this. Now God incense him and let him cry ha louder. Tis so. But the cardinal, observe, observe, he is moody. <laughs> Shall be to the Duchess of Alençon, the French king's sister. He shall marry her. No, I'll know Anne Boleyn. It's more than it's a fair visage. Boleyn. No, we'll know Boleyn. Speedily, I wish to hear from her. Oh, Jeanette. He is discontented. Maybe he hears the king does wet his anger to him. <laughs> the late queen's gentlewoman, a knight's daughter, to be her mistress's mistress, the queen's queen. No, this candle burns not clear. Tis I must stop it, then out it goes. What? Though I know her to be virtuous and well deserving, yet I know her for a spleeny Lutheran and not wholesome to our cause. Lie in the bosom of our heart. He is vexed at something. The king! The king! What piles of wealth have he accumulated to his own portion? What expense by the hour seems to flow from him? How in the name of thrift does he rake this together? Now, my lords, saw you the cardinal? My lord, we have stood here observing him. Some strange commotion in his brain. But he bites his lip and then starts out, stops on the sudden, then looks upon the ground, lays a finger upon his temple, straight springs out into fast gait, then stops again, strikes his chest hard, and then anon he casts his eye against the moon. Oh, in most strange postures we have seen him set himself. It may well be. There is a mutiny in his mind. This morning, papers of state, he sent me to Bones, as I required, and what you what I found there, on my conscience put unwittingly, forsooth, an inventory, thus importing the several parcels of his wealth, his treasures, rich stuffs, ornaments of household, which I find at such proud rate that it outspeaks possession of a subject. Tis heaven's will. Some spirit put the paper in the packet to bless your eye with all. If we did think his contemplation were above the earth and fixed on spiritual object, he should still dwell in his musings. But I am afraid his thinkings are below the moon, not worth his serious considerings. Your evidence! Heaven forgive me! Ever God bless your highness! My lord, you are full of heavenly stuffs. <laughs> Bear the interest of your best graces in mind, the which of now you are running over. You have scarce time to steal from spiritual leisure, a brief span to keep your earthly on it. Sure, in that I deem you an ill husband, and am glad to have you therein like a pet. 
sir, for holy offices, I have a time, a time to think upon the part of business which I bear in the state, and nature does require her times of preservation, which, of course, I, her frail son, amongst my brethren mortal, must give my tendance to. We have spoken well. May your highness yoke together, as I will lend you cause, my doing well with my well said. Tis well said again, and it is kind of a good deed to say well, and yet words are no deeds. My father loved you, he said he did, and with his deed did crown his word upon you. Since I've had my office, I have kept you next my heart, and now the Lord employed you where my profits might come home, but instead had my present havings to bestow my bounties upon you. What should this be? The Lord increase this business. Have I not made you prime man of the state? I pray you now, tell me, if I pronounce what you have found to be true, and if you may confess it, say with all whether you are bound to us or no. What say you? My sovereign, I confess your royal graces showered upon me daily have been more than could my study studied purposes requite, which went beyond all man's endeavors. Uh, my endeavors have come ever too short of my desires, yet filed with mine abilities. Uh, mine own ends have been mine, so that evermore they pointed to the good of your most sacred person and the profit of the state. Before your great graces uh, heaped upon me, poor undeserver, I can nothing render but allegiant thanks, my prayers to heaven for you. My loyalty, which ever has and ever shall be growing till death that winter kill. Tis fairly spoken. A loyal and obedient subject is there and illustrated. The honor of it does pay the act of it. As in the contrary, the foulness is the punishment. I presume that as my hand has opened bounty to you, my heart Rough love, my honor, great power, on you more than any. So your hand and heart and brain and every function of your being should, notwithstanding that your bond of duty, be more to me, your friend, than any. I do profess that for your highness's good I ever labored more than my own, that am, have, and will be, though all the world should crack their duty to you and throw it from their soul. Though the horrors did abound as thick as thought could make them and appear in forms yet more wretched, yet my duty as thus a rock against the chiding flood, should the approach of this wild river break and stand unshaken, yours. Tis nobly spoken. Take notice, lords. He has a loyal and obedient breast, for you have seen him open it. Oh. Oh. Read this. And after this. And then to breakfast with what appetite you have. Be my friends in Rome. What a cross devil! 
devil who made me put this main secret in the packet I sent the king! Ugh, negligence! Fit for a fool to fall by! Is there no way to cure this, no! New device to beat this from his brains! I know. We'll stir him strongly. Yet, I know a way if it take right in spite of fortune will bring me off again. I went to His Holiness. Ethan, farewell. I have touched the highest point of all my greatness. From that full meridian of my glory, I haste now to my setting. I shall fall like a bright exhalation in the evening. It's no man see me more. Hear the king's pleasure, Cardinal, who commands you to render up the great seal presently into our hands, and to confine yourself to Asher House, my lord of Winchester, till you hear further from his highness. Stay! your commission, lords. Words cannot carry authority so weighty. Who dare cross him, bearing the king's will from his mouth expressly? Till I find more than words or will to do it, I need your malice. No, officious lords, I dare and must deny it. Oh. Now I feel that the coarse metal we are molded. Envy! How eagerly ye follow my disgraces, sit and fetch ye! And how sleek and wanton ye appear in everything may bring my ruin! Follow your envious courses, men of malice! Ye have Christian warrant for them, and no doubt in time will find their fit rewards. You ask with such a violence. The king, mine, and your master with his own hand gave me and bade me enjoy it with the place and honors during my life. And to confirm his goodness, tied it with letters patents. Now, who will take it? The king that gave it. It must be himself then. You're a proud traitor, priest. Now, if you can blush and cry guilty, Cardinal, you'll show a little honesty. Oh, speak on, sir. I dare your worst objection. If I blush, it is to see a nobleman want manners. I had rather want those than my head. How about you? First, without the king's will or knowledge, you wrought to be legate, by which power you maim the jurisdiction of all bishops. Nay, in all you writ to Rome, or else to foreign princes, ego et rex meus was still inscribed, in which you brought the king to be your servant. Then that, without knowledge either of king or council, when you went ambassador to the emperor, you made bold to carry into Flanders the great seal. Item, you sent a large commission to Gregory Casado to conclude, without the king's will or the state's allowance, a league between his highness and Ferreira. That, out of mere ambition, you have caused your holy hat to be stamped on the king's coin. Many more there are, which, since they are of you and odious, I will not taint my mouth with. Oh, my ah! lord, press not a falling man too far. Tis virtue his faults lie open to the laws. Let them, not you, correct him. My heart weeps to see him so little in his great self. Lord Cardinal, 
the king's further pleasure is, because all those things you have done of late by your power, Legatine, within this kingdom, fall into the compass of a primary, that therefore such a writ be sued against you to forfeit all your goods, lands, tenements, chattels, and whatsoever had to be out of the king's protection. This is my charge. So we lead you to your meditations how to live better. As for the giving back of the great seal to us and the stubborn answer we have received, the king shall know it and no doubt shall thank you. <laughs> so fare you well, my little good Lord Cardinal. <laughs> so farewell to the little good you bear me. Farewell, all oh, my greatness. This is the state of man. Today, he puts forth the tender leaves of hope. Tomorrow, he blossoms, bears his blushing honors thick upon him. The third day there comes a frost, a killing frost. When he thinks, good, easy man, full sure his greatness is a ripening, nips his root, but then he falls as I do. Oh, how wretched is that poor man that hangs on princes' favors! There is Betwixt that smile we would aspire to, that sweet aspect of princes and their ruin, all pangs and fears the walls of women have. And when he falls, he falls like Lucifer, never to hope again. Had I but served my God, with half the zeal he served my king. He would not in my age have left me naked to my enemies. Farewell, the hopes of court. My hopes in heaven to dwell. <laughs>